It's been nearly a hundred days since Myanmar's military took power in a coup and arrested civilian leaders, including Aung San Suu Kyi. But the people of Myanmar seem determined to hold on to the democratically elected government they gained in 2015. They've refused to go back to the military rule they lived under for half a century. The coup triggered civil disobedience and mass protests. Myanmar's security forces have responded with violence. Hundreds of people have been killed in the crackdown, thousands more injured, and others have been arrested without charge. For many in Myanmar, the only hope they have to avoid any further escalation is the international community's intervention. Shortly after the coup in February, Myanmar's UN ambassador spoke out against the military. We need further strongest possible action from the international community to immediately end the military coup, to stop oppressing the innocent people, to return the state power to the people, and to restore the democracy. But now Myanmar's neighbors and members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations don't appear to be standing up to the military. In fact, the head of the junta, General Min Ong Lai, attended ASEAN summit in Jakarta on the 24th of April. I'm James Bays at the United Nations in New York. It was here in the UN General Assembly that Myanmar's ambassador to the United Nations, Jo Mo Tun, contrary to many people's expectations, stood against the military junta. The army leaders tried to fire the ambassador, but the UN still recognizes him. Many countries welcomed his brave statement, including the US. Let me be clear from the outset. The United States continues to strongly condemn the military coup in Myanmar, and we condemn the security forces' brutal killing of unarmed people. Others, like China, have refused to condemn the military coup. As the conflict continues to escalate, will it turn into a civil war? Will the international community reach a consensus or remain polarized? Myanmar's ambassador to the UN, Jo Mo Tun, talks to Al Jazeera. Jo Mo Tun, ambassador of Myanmar to the United Nations, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. In your country, there was a coup on the 1st of February. Ever since, the death toll has mounted. Do you now believe that not only was the will, the democratic will of your people suppressed, but those same people have now been abandoned by the international community? I'm not really agree with that uh, because, you know, you look at the, 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 in, uh, the support from the international community, it's still growing. But at the same time, of course, we need to have it, you know, stronger and stronger, and the the support from the international uh, international uh, community. Because, you know, within the country, the democratic forces, we are fighting against the military regime. We we are fighting against the military coup because we want to end this military coup as soon as possible. Because we want to save lives of innocent civilians because as you you rightly pointed out that it's more than you know 700 people being already killed and the many many people being arrested and the many many people being beaten tortured by the military so that we need help from the international community so but even though they are keep on you know providing support from the international community but we still need further stronger you know, action from the international community. Well, we'll examine the um, issue of international support in more detail a little later on, but let me take you back. Elections took place in your country in November, and re-elected was a government led by the National League for Democracy Party of Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, you were here in New York, and in, just in the end of January, when did you start to suspect something was up? Because the day before the coup, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, put out a statement expressing great concern about the situation. When did you know something was up? Actually, you know, the, the sense that I got, I mean, the high sense that I got, it's in the last week of January. 
of course, before that, there were you know the the spokesperson from the military make the you know, statement here and there, talking about you know the uh, election frauds, and then also you know they were doing it according to the you know uh, the uh, the the constitution. All options are open. That sort of that statement that that they made. But uh, personally, I didn't think that they would do it. But in the last week of January, I heard that you know the negotiations taking place between the government and the military and the NLD political party and the uh, military. But on the especially on 27, 28 of January, land that you know that negotiation didn't go away. And when you heard that the coup had taken place, you were then put in a difficult position, I assume. You had to decide whether you now were going to take your orders from the generals or whether you were going to reject those orders. How long did it take you to make up your mind? You know, the, on the uh, 2nd of February, as you know, the, and the Security Council had the closed door meeting. So on that day, uh, uh, I had the, uh, the chance to, uh, to speak uh, with you know, the, then the president of the UN Security Council, Ambassador Bar uh, Barbara. Uh, so in that in Barbara Woodward, the, yes. who was the president of the Security Secretary, Council at yes, the time, the, the British the ambassador. Ambassador. Yes, so in since then, you know, I expressed, you know, I, uh, the disappointment with the, you know, the military coup because since then I, I make it myself clear that I would not disappoint the people of Myanmar. I think the first time you spoke publicly was a few weeks later on the 26th of February. That's when you spoke yep. in the UN General Assembly. Now, some of your fellow ambassadors tell me they didn't know what you were going to say and whether you were going to speak in support of the generals. I was watching your speech. We were carrying it live on Al Jazeera and we heard you condemn the coup, condemn what, is, what was happening in the country and we heard your voice cracking with emotion. What was going through your mind as you addressed the General Assembly? Of course, you know, this is big, uh, this is the, you know, quite difficult, I should say difficult time because, you know, I have to think of myself, my future, and then as well as the you know, future of my, my family members and uh, every, everything. So, but, you know, on that time that deliver, you know, because I feel so uh, sorry about those people inside the country, they, they've been suffered and then they've been killed, they've been, you know, beaten. So that it's, it's one I'm delivering a statement. It's record those kind of, you know, events in Myanmar. So it's a make me, you know, quite, you know, uh, my voice quite cracking and, you know, even I, actually I'm trying to control myself, uh, 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 not dropping any tears from my eyes, you know. The whole world recognized the speech, the power and the bravery of that speech and so did the generals in Myanmar. They sent the UN a letter saying that you'd been sacked and your deputy was taking over, but then your deputy resigned his job. Tell us what was going on behind the scenes here, here in, the, in the Myanmar mission to the UN. After I delivered the statement, I went back to the mission. And then the, during the uh, afternoon also, my colleague at uh, the DPR, uh, he, Your deputy ambassador. Yeah, deputy ambassador. Uh, he told me that uh, uh, he support me, but it will be difficult to continue here. So that he wanted uh, to to return back to 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 Myanmar. So that he sent a, a letter uh, uh, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for recalling him back to Myanmar. Then instead of you know recall uh, recall him back. Uh, they, they dismissed me and they appointed him as the charge affairs of the mission. Then he, in the, on the Monday, uh, the 1st of March, uh, the, my deputy, uh, the, the DPR, he again, he consulted me and he said he, he would uh, submit uh, the letter of resignation to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And how are you now still running this mission, this embassy to the UN? Yes. Because you are detached from your country. Who, for example, is paying the salaries of, of the diplomats who are working here? How are you funding this operation? So uh, lucky that, you know, uh, in our account in the, of the missions, we stay as some, some fund uh, uh, so that I stay can rely on the, you know, the, the, uh, the money that we have in the missions account. As you said, defiantly, you 
are still holding the UN sit seat here in New York. But when the UN Human Rights Council met in Geneva in March, addressing it virtually was a foreign ministry official from Napador giving the side of the generals. So the generals represented in Geneva, you representing the democratically elected politicians in New York. Are you still fighting, do you think, for the recognition, to keep hold of the fact that you are the recognized ambassador? Yeah, of course, this thing I have to, to do continuously because uh, as I, uh, in, in, since the beginning, I make it clear that uh, I, I was appointed by the civilian government, so I remain as a permanent representative of Myanmar here. Of course, the credential issue will be, you know, coming on and off. So I have to be vigilant, of course, because I want to support the people of Myanmar as much as I can. I, I want to be the, with the people of Myanmar as long as I can. So that, you know, whatever way that we, I can, uh, and that, uh, whatever way that we can, make it clear that, you know, whoever sitting here in the New York are, uh, are representing the people of Myanmar. Your counterpart in London, the Myanmar ambassador to the UK, took a similar stand to you, and then he found himself locked out of his embassy. For the first day, he had to sleep in his car outside. Are you disappointed that the UK went along with his sacking? I mean, the UK that perhaps has some historical responsibility here. They may be one of the reasons why the military is so powerful in your country as the formal colonial power. Yeah, so sorry for my colleague uh, in, in London. He slept in the car uh, uh, the whole night, and then you know he he was now he is you know confined in his his residence. We need to you know review this kind of you know situation. We need to review uh, the you know the decision made by the you know the uh, the, the the government of United Kingdom. Of course, when I uh, respecting. Uh, their, uh, their policy, their, uh, their, uh, their position, but at the same time, that is, that is the unusual stuff, you know, then they need to look at the issue from the innovative uh, point of view. That, that is why, what we like to, you know, request the, you know, the government or United Kingdom to look at it and whatever decision that they make, please consider the desire of the people, especially, you know, the people inside the country who are facing the uh, the brutal and inhumane act committed by the military. So we need help from the international community. In the speech in the General Assembly, you called for all strongest possible measures to stop the violent and brutal acts committed by the security forces. But you haven't received that, have you? There have been three statements by the UN Security Council, and yes, they say the detained, democratically elected politicians should be released. They condemn the violence. But the key thing missing is they're not threatening any sort of action. The, the statements issued by the Security Council now is three statements, two press statements and one presidential st uh, statement. Whatever uh, the provisions or the elements contained in the press statements or the presidential statement, uh, we appreciate it, of course. You know, this is, uh, uh, this, is this kind of uh, language have to be adopted by consensus. So, so I thank the member state of the uh, UN Security Council for their unifying voices. But at the same time, again, we need, really need the stronger, you know, the, the decisive action from the international community, like the, uh, uh, in particular, the UN Security Council. But Look you know, you know yeah. Ambassador, the countries that are opposing tougher action, they are China, and they are Russia. China is one of your neighbours. Russia even sent its Deputy Defence Minister to attend the Armed Forces Day on March the 26th, the day that saw the highest number of protesters killed at any point. Yeah. What do you make of China and Russia? Uh, we cannot ignore the rule of China because they are the, you know, uh, 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 China is a neighbouring country and they have a lot of uh, investment in Myanmar. So, but at the same time, we, we cannot ignore the perception of the people of Myanmar vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Because, you know, the, uh, the people of Myanmar, whenever you talk about China, people of Myanmar think that uh, China supporting the military. But China 
saying that you know they want the you know country you know uh, a stable and prosperous uh, 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 nation of Myanmar. That is what we really appreciate it. But at the same time, they should respect the you know desire of the people. This is the best time, uh, the best opportunity for China to make it clear that they are with the people of Myanmar, they are not with the military. With regard to Russia, yet you rightly point out that the Deputy Defense Minister was there. Of course, many of us are uh, 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 disappointed with the, you know, the presence of the you know, high-level delegation from the Russia during the, and the Armed Forces Day in, in, in Myanmar. What about the other countries that are in Myanmar's neighborhood? What do you make of the response of the members of the regional grouping, the 10 members of ASEAN, so far to what has happened? We want them to listen to the voices of the people of Myanmar, because now the voices coming from the people of Myanmar are desperate. Now we are facing the you know, humanitarian crisis as well, because we need the humanitarian assistance from, uh, from international community. But the difficult point is the humanitarian passage. That is what we really need it because sometimes it, the humanitarian assistance now cannot come directly uh, uh, from the you know Yangon or Mandalay or you know big ports. But what we see is that you know the the humanitarian assistance can be provided through the neighboring countries. So we need help from the neighboring countries for the humanitarian assistance. Also, we need help from the neighboring countries to give shelter to the people who take refuge in the, you know, the neighboring country, especially in Thailand and India. ASEAN, the, the, the issue, the statement is you know, encouraging this and that and those, but we still need action from the, the uh, ASEAN. The national unity government has been declared by the committee representing the detained politicians. This, it's not a government, it's an idea for a government. We know who is running things in Myanmar, we know who holds the levers of power and perhaps more importantly the guns. So, I mean, is this a realistic con concept, this national unity government? Yeah, you know, because for us, the democratic forces, we have to, you know, bring back the state power whatever way that we can. What we see is that this is the government uh, supported by the people of Myanmar. That is the government it's with, it, it's, it have the legitimacy from the people because it is a mandated by the people. But we need to work, continue uh, working on having you know, the strong support from the international community. We cannot seek back and you know, uh, no, let the you know, military do whatever they want, but we have to fight back whatever way that we, 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 we can. The national unity government has been declared. What is important, I think, is it has various ethnic groups in it who were not represented in the previous government. Now, some of those ethnic groups have effective control of their territory, and some have arms. Should they now take up their arms? Now, now we are aiming to have the federal army uh, composed of uh, the uh, uh, actors from the different different ethnic and organization. But you've, so got, you've, you've, got got to, you've got to replace the generals who are there in power at the moment. For now, do you think those that have arms who are on your side should start fighting? I At the moment, so. you've seen peaceful protest, but is it time to start fighting the military? I think some already started, I should say. Some ethnic armed organizations, they already, you know, make it clear that they're not supporting the, you know, the military. They're supporting the national unity government, and they are keep asking the military not to act brutally, to be in line with the you know, international humanitarian uh, law and I international human rights law. So those sort of things are already happening. Let me ask you about one ethnic group, which I don't think is represented in the National Unity Government, and that is the Rohingya. Before the coup, the former government of Aung San Suu Kyi had widespread criticism of the treatment of the Rohingya. And I, let me just read you something you said in the third committee of the uh, United Nations, that's the committee that deals with human rights, a speech you made six months ago. You said, Myanmar firmly opposes any politicization of human rights and humanitarian issues. My delegation strongly rejects the resolution. In that speech, were you not defending 
the army who were attacking Rohingya and now they're attacking everyone in Myanmar. Do you regret words like that? You, you know, uh, it is you, thanks for the questions. You know, thanks for giving this opportunity. You know, we, uh, people uh, misunderstood the, you know, the way that the you know, government led by the Daong San Suu Kyi uh, and deal with this issue. You know, the, uh, the issue in Yakai State is very complex, very complicated. That, that is, so whenever we address the issue, in Yakai State, we need to look at from the multi-dimensional point of view, not only from the one point of view, because it can bring the you know the huge problem inside the country. So that is why the uh, the government of or the uh, NLD-led government, they always pointed out that you know we respect the human right, we respect the you know the uh, the rights of the et uh, uh, the ethnic nationalities, minorities, religious gr group. You know, that, that's sort of, you know, the respect that we always uh, given to. So that is, you know, I, that is what the, 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 uh, the statement that I made in the, you know, the November, what I see is, is uh, you know, I, it is very right way that I make because, because you know, the, the, what the government is doing is that they need to look at the issue from the multiple uh, dimension. You know, we also, you know, always pointed out that with regard to the accountability. We, we, we have the, you know, the, 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 the report come, uh, came out from the, you know, the ICOE. That report also clearly s stated that, that atrocity took place in the, in the Yakin State in 2016 and 2017. So we, what we're uh, trying to, uh, to point it out th is that we respect the accountability. We concern the, you know, all the, you know, the atrocity uh, take, uh, took place in 2016 and 2017. But what we stress is that should fast exhaust the domestic legal mechanism fast. When you look at Myanmar's recent history, I mean, for example, Aung San Suu Kyi, she's now under arrest, but she was under arrest or house arrest or had her movements restricted for most of the time between 1989 and 2010. Do you have fears that this could go on for a very long time? Yeah, uh, definitely, you know, because that is why we don't want this uh, uh, crisis longer and longer. We don't want it. That is why sometimes what we feel is that any involvement from the, you know, anyone, any regional organization, any, uh, you know, international organization make the pain longer. That is what we don't want. We need to make the, uh, we need to make it clear that the pain that we are, uh, we are, uh, we are facing should be shortened and shortened. But Ambassador, let me just put you, perhaps it's probably hard for you, but put you in the mind of the military rulers in Myanmar. Even if you had overwhelming international support, tough sanctions against them, why would they give up power now after all the bloodshed? They know that they'll go on trial if they give up power. So why would they give up power? A country cannot stand by themselves. It's very difficult. You know, so that, you know, with the, for us in, the, in, in Myanmar, people already, you know, uh, enjoying the, you know, uh, 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 freedom, enjoying the freedom of expression, you know, sort of, uh, to some extent, the, you know, the, the strong, the human rights that we already enjoy for like the last 10 years. So that is why especially our young people, they don't want to, you know, go back to the, you know, the system. They go, uh, don't want to go back to the situation that we have before 2010. Let me read you a quote from the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, recently. I fear the situation in Myanmar is heading towards a full-blown conflict. States must not allow the deadly mistakes of the past in Syria and elsewhere to be repeated. Is that comparison with Syria realistic? Are you worried about a civil war? Of course, you know, we, we worry about the civil war, of course, but it's going it to be difficult to compare with what happened in, in, in Syria and what happened in Myanmar. That is the, 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 there, there are the differences. You know, because in here, what we are having is that a group of, 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 of people who with the leather weapons, a people of Myanmar who do not have 
any weapons. These two groups are confronting. So this is the, you know, the, uh, the, the difference that we have. So that you know, we need to, uh, to, to get the support from the international community to the people of Myanmar. Because we always you know, talking about you know, the government you know, all over the world. So because we like to see the government, the government is of the people, by the people, for the people. That is what we want. So the military coup must fail. Democracy must prevail in Myanmar. Our fight will win. Jo Mo Tun, Ambassador of Myanmar to the United Nations. Thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.